When I hear the word craft, I immediately think of my aunts. All of them are avid crafters who for years would attend our annual family vacation unloading bins upon bins of crafting materials from their minivans into our tiny family cabin. During this week in hot and humid July, they gathered around card tables, stitching, painting, and hot glue gunning various Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas decor. Thinking about these memories, I frequently am reminded of the laughter that would fill the room as they sat, crafted, and shared stories. This is how I came to know craft, by watching my aunts make, talk, and be amongst each other. I understand craft then as a relational practice, working with one's body while in conversation, companionship, and camaraderie with other bodies in the making of things. My definition of craft then is informed from such memories of my aunts where I witness craft as a practice facilitating relationality. And so, I find craft as an embodied practice, operating as Prince suggests, quote, as a particular set of actions and relationships between people and between people and things. The notion of craft as relational, as linking between bodies and things, was something I grew up watching on these family vacations. Yet I myself never identified as a crafter. This changed, however, as I encountered a series of personal losses and found myself engaging in various types of craft as a way to make sense of such loss. My first connection to craft developed when one of my aunts passed away. My Aunt Joanne was the first of all the aunts to die, and her death, especially as it was my first experience with a loved one dying, was particularly hard to cope with. But in grieving her loss, I came to understand craft's relationality through craft's materiality. That is, if craft is relational, its relationality is not limited to that which is physically visible. Its relationality extends beyond that which is living and present amongst us. Craft then can function as an embodied memorialization, honoring and reminding us of all those relations that have passed on before us. Let me share how. This is my Aunt Chuan. She died in 2007 of breast cancer, a few weeks after she turned 50 years old. Up until the final days of her death, she remained her spirited, feisty self. When she died, though, a void was immediately felt in our family. Her quick-witted humor, her chuckling laugh, the numerous phone calls she made to us during the day, all suddenly vanished. There was also an eerie sense of finality to her death because she had always lived by herself. She never married, never had a partner, and so in many ways, when she died, so died the life that she quite literally crafted. To keep memories of her alive to those who knew her best, my grandparents painstakingly redistributed nearly all of her possessions. This process of gifting an object to one of my aunt's close friends or family members served not only practical purposes, but memorializing purposes. The things my aunt once collected and housed were now passed along to others as a way to remember my aunt. For every object my grandmother gave away, a story was shared about why that individual should have said object. The practice of assigning stories and memories to particular objects in many ways transformed the object into a craft. No longer were these objects just things in my aunt's house, but things that now served as memories, connecting us to my aunt. Take this serving tray. Decoupage letters and cards sent from my Aunt Joanne cover the tray, which was given to my grandparents from a relative to remember and celebrate my aunt's life. Craft appears in this piece both as it memorializes my aunt's handwriting and the story shared in the cards, and it also transforms the cards and letters into a new object. This decision to place the cards and letters onto a serving tray was intentional. Instead of simply giving the cards and letters to my grandparents, the serving tray functions as a celebratory object. The tray is often used at family celebratory gatherings and a reminder that my Aunt Joanne is always with us. My Aunt Joanne's death taught me to understand the ways in which her memories continue to live on with us, often through the crafting and repurposing of her life. In my own life, I found much comfort in having pieces crafted by my aunt. 
During the process of redistributing her possessions, I expressed interest in having a craft that she created. This desire wasn't out of wanting a specific item, but of wanting an object that she created, an object made through her own body. For example, I like having this bowl that she made in high school. I like observing the design and the shape of the bowl. I like running my hands over the bowl, knowing that her own hands had once crafted and shaped this chunk of clay into an object. I like turning the bowl over and seeing her initials scraped into the bottom. Her crafting of this piece serves as a physical link to an object her body made. The bowl to me remains an object representing the embodiment of my aunt, a piece of her that remains present despite her physical passing. Craft can emerge then in the objects we memorialize, connecting to and facilitating a spirit of relationality amongst ourselves and those who passed away. Craft as a memorializing practice can also emerge through cultural mourning rituals, guiding the ways in which we mourn and say goodbye to deceased loved ones. This understanding of craft emerged more fully as I dealt with the death of my Uncle Paul, who passed away suddenly of a heart attack this past November. Unprepared for his death, my sisters and I gathered around to support my grandparents, who had now lost two out of their three children. The week before Thanksgiving then consisted of assisting in numerous funeral arrangements. Two particular tasks involved very much the practice of crafting. Picture boards and slideshows of my uncle with his family were requested by the funeral director. For two days, my sisters and I shuffled through old photographs, albums, and boxes to craft memories of my uncle for friends and family to remember him by. As I returned home from my week-long stay, I recounted the events of my uncle's passing and was struck at how threads of crafting weaved themselves throughout my experience. During my stay, I was continually reminded of how my uncle would craft music as a composer and craft spectacular gin martinis. While we hustled about making funeral arrangements, friends and family crafted delicious pies, breads, and traditional Czech kolaches to nurture our grief and pain. We were always either talking of crafting, recipients of crafting, or crafting our goodbyes to my uncle that week. During the preparations for my uncle's funeral, it became very apparent to me that craft is also very much a part of the memorializing of those who have passed before us. Craft provides a material link to the physical body that is no longer with us. Instead, through the crafting of serving trays, bowls, or even the crafting of picture boards and slideshows, craft culture remembers and embodies those who have passed away. My story about my Uncle Paul, and even my Aunt Joanne, is rooted very much in Western Christian cultural traditions. Yet many other cultures share similar rituals that involve craft to connect us and help us mourn those who have died. Take the practice of making nichos, often displayed in ofrendas, as a way to memorialize those who have passed away. Or take even the Jewish practice of sitting shiva, in which family members take one week to honor and mourn the passing away of a relative and host visitors at the home through prayer and food. These rituals all center around craft. Craft offers a physical materiality then to the physical void of a body no longer with us and facilitates a continued sense of relationality. But craft also works to memorialize that which may never come into being. I've thought a lot about this, especially in relation to infertility, which is typically a silent physical void, hardly known or visible to the general public. But for many individuals who encounter infertility, there is a deep feeling of physical loss and a desire to express and honor that which was never meant to be. I speak to this from personal experience and my diagnosis with infertility. Coming to understand my female body as an infertile body was extremely disorienting and isolating. Some of this is because of cultural silence that surrounds infertility. And this silence often leads to a stigma about the disease because, as Allison finds, silence, quote, sustains the myth of fertility as a universal experience, suppressing contrary experiences and an ideology of motherhood and symbolic ideal a family. Understanding the isolation, the silence, the confusion of experiencing infertility, of experiencing this physical void present in such a body, 
is important to understanding the ways in which craft can both memorialize that child that may never come into being, as well as translate and share such experience to others who may have never experienced infertility. Taking time to craft about my experience with infertility has encouraged a practice of mindfulness. By mindfulness, I mean that craft allows for a retrospection, a reconnection amongst my body and my mind. Crafting images representing my infertility engages my body in a process that allows me to take a break from the constant questions that surround myself, like why isn't my body working? And instead, as an embodied practice, craft reminds me of the ways in which my body is already strong, already making, already creating. And while craft connects me to my own body, it also connects me to the little body I may never get to know. My crafting around infertility, then, is not only a crafting to understand my body, but a crafting to memorialize this desire, hope, and wanting to carry my own child. And so my crafts, like the ones shown, are little offerings, little tokens of what I may never physically experience, but emotionally experience on a day-to-day -day level. The sharing of these memorialized crafts to others functions as a practice of translation as well. Craft translates beyond that of traditional discourse as it is a form of multimodality. In this way, craft is an accessible medium in which individuals can represent uncommon or marginalized experiences to the greater public. Yet unlike traditional discourse, which can also express marginalized experiences, craft engages embodied complexity. Craft facilitates mindfulness within the realm of the crafter, and in this way, craft also communicates not only the discursive realities of an experience, but the embodied and effective realities. Craft then is a powerful medium in which individuals can intervene within dominant discourses of the body. Infertile activist and art education scholar Melissa McClure, in her piece, Smothering, has advocated for the ways in which crafting experiences of infertility can intervene in the dominant discourses that perpetuate a culture privileging notions of ableism, parenthood, and traditional motherhood. Critically engaging in feminist art and scholarship can begin to translate new realities of experiences of motherhood and infertility because of the potential craft holds as an accessible public pedagogy. So if craft memorializes relationships and translates experiences beyond discourse, how is craft rhetorical? To address this question, I draw on Dickinson, Blair, and Ott's definition of rhetoric, which claims, quote, we do not see rhetoric as a genre of discourse, or even necessarily discursive at all. Rather, we take rhetoric to be a set of theoretical stances and critical tactics that offer ways of understanding, evaluating, and intervening in a broad range of human activities. Their definition understands rhetoric as a sort of process of a doing, of a meaning making. And this is very much what craft is, a process, a doing, a meaning making amongst bodies and people and people and things. Through cultural mourning practices, craft allows us to remember and continue to connect with those who have passed away. Craft also allows us to represent those individuals who may never enter into being. And craft can also translate these experiences through its embodied and effective multimodality to those who may not have shared such experience. In this way, craft is a rhetorical act as a memorializing and relational interaction is a form of public pedagogy. It facilitates relationality amongst ourselves, amongst those who have passed away, amongst those who have never been, and amongst those who may not understand or relate. And so craft is really never just about what has been crafted, but about the stories those crafted objects communicate. Just like the stories my aunts shared and told as they crafted on hot summer afternoons. Yeah.